Some people change. That's the truth. It might be a debate that you've had with a toxic relationship in your life. And some people never change. Or maybe some people change a little too much. Welcome to worship. My name is Joe Varner, and I'm so happy that I get to be the pastor of Thalia United Methodist Church. I want to thank you for spending this time in your life, in your crazy week, in your crazy schedule to worship with us, to be a part of our family of faith, even if it's only for the next half hour. Today, we're going to explore the radical transformation that Moses experiences in God's presence through the story of the golden calf. If you've never heard this story before, or if this is the 20,000th time you've heard about the Israelites making a golden calf and worshiping it, I want to encourage you to stick around with us this morning because we might learn more about ourselves, about God, and how we relate to others through this message that some people do change. So let's prepare our hearts for worship through our centering moment. O oh Lord, majestic in holiness, who is like you? In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. O oh Lord, awesome in splendor, who is like you? Your right hand, O oh Lord, glorious in power, shattered the enemy. O oh Lord, worker of wonders, who is like you? Sing to the Lord my strength and my might. You are my salvation. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us ask for inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Exodus 32. The Lord spoke to Moses, hurry up and go down, your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, are ruining everything. They've already abandoned the path that I commanded. They have already made a metal bull calf for themselves. They've bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it and declared, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord says to Moses, 
I've been watching these people, and I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants whom you yourself promised, I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I've promised to give your descendants this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he said he would do to his people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now that we've heard the story about God nearly smiting the whole Israelite family and starting over with Moses, let's ask for inspiration from the Holy Spirit to make sense of how this passage is speaking life to our souls right now. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we give you thanks for your holy word. There are so many times when we read the holy scriptures and we're simply puzzled. And the story of the golden calf, Moses' intercessory prayers, and your desire, your desire to fulfill your purpose, it puzzles us. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit fire would rain down on us wherever we may be. Help us to hear whatever you want to say, and to see whatever you want to show us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This message, the story of Moses and God and the Israelites and this golden calf is a really puzzling moment in the Exodus experience, when God brings out this multitude of people from their slavery in Egypt, leads them to freedom through the sea, feeds them manna, this bread from heaven in the wilderness, makes the rock spring water and supplies for the needs of God's people. And then God thunders from the mountain and delivers the Ten Commandments. Now, after we've been given these Ten Commandments, Moses has been stuck with God for a while. And as my grandfather used to say, idle hands are the devil's handiwork, the people get restless, and they turn to Moses' brother Aaron. And they say to Aaron, this Moses who delivered us from slavery and led us through the sea. We don't know what's happened to him. So why don't you make for us gods that we can worship? Aaron doesn't seem to put up much of a fight. And so Aaron instructs them to take off their golden jewelry and to bring it to him. And now we hear that Aaron fills a sack with this golden jewelry and melts it down and creates this golden calf. But I want you to, for a moment, imagine the multitude of gold that these people have brought to Aaron. This wasn't just like a family of 30 or 40 who brought Aaron their pieces of jewelry. This was a multitude of the thousands bringing to Aaron their earrings and the bracelets and their necklaces made of gold. And from this multitude, this stockpile of gold that these thousands of people have offered to Aaron, Aaron fashions this thing that looks like a golden calf. And he presents it to the people and says, this is your God who delivered you out of slavery. And they have a festival and they worship this false God. What a strange story, isn't it? 
how can this group of people who witnessed the Lord God deliver them from Egypt? They walked through the sea on dry ground. And it says in that story that they believed in God and Moses, their leader. And about three months roll by and they've experienced God feed them bread from heaven. They've experienced God quench their thirst by making the rock spring forth water. And they've gone through each of these experiences together. And you would think, like we've probably thought before, that if we could just see a miracle, if we could just see God do something in our lives, it would be so much easier to believe in God. You ever have one of those moments? You ever think, wow, you know, if, if I could just see a little something, if God would just speak a word to me, or if, or if God could change this one circumstance, I would worship God with all that I have. I would serve God obediently. I would do everything possible to show God how much I love the Lord. And yet, we read this story in Exodus 32. These people have experienced what so many of us crave for. They've experienced numerous instances of God showing up in their lives. And that was not enough to stop them from committing one of the worst sins in God's book. The sin of idolatry. When we take something that God has made and we elevate it to God's status. That's what idolatry is. It's when we worship something, when we give worth to something other than God. And the truth is, many of us wrestle with idolatry every single day. Idolatry is at the heart of all that corrupts us from the divine image. We're going to spend a little time this morning thinking about the false idols in our lives. But most importantly, I want to point you to the good news of this story. And it's this encounter that Moses has with God. And we're going to get there because this is what we're going to focus on when we think about the kind of change that God's grace can produce in our lives even today. So let's spend a moment here sitting with the Israelites and reflecting on how we do the very same thing. For some of us, it might be our jobs. For others of us, it might be money or status or power. And still for others, it could be toxic relationships. What's going on in your life right now that is occupying a majority of your thoughts, your worries, and your desires. It could be that whatever that is, whether it's your work, whether it's dysfunctional relationships, status, whatever it may be for you, it could be that we're stuck in idol worship. Now that might sound strange, but it's the same thing that happened here with the Israelites. After Moses, their fearful leader, has been on top of the mountain listening to the rest of God's law. Moses is actually doing what the people asked him to do. This is a strange leadership lesson. You know, there are times when leaders will do what their people ask them to do, and it's still not quite enough. If you've ever served in a leadership role, maybe in a church or at work, or maybe you hold a leadership position in your family, and you actually do what the people have asked you to do, and it's not quite good enough. Have you ever dealt with that before? So Moses, after the people have heard God deliver the Ten Commandments, tell Moses, Moses, we can't handle hearing the voice of God. We need you to hear God for us because if we hear the voice of the Lord, we're going to die. 
And so Moses fills in for the people. He serves as their priest and their prophet. And he goes up the mountain to hear the rest of God's law. And while Moses is on top of the mountain, listening for all of God's law, not just the Ten Commandments, but laws like caring for orphans, widows, and immigrants, while Moses is on the mountain receiving the rest of God's instructions for following this God into freedom, it's not quite good enough. And the people begin to wonder, what happened to our leader? He's been gone for too long. We need something to worship. Strange things happen when there's a leadership vacuum, when there is this sense of emptiness in our lives, and it creeps in in our lives today, when there is a sense of emptiness, when we may not feel God's presence. There is something about our human nature that needs to worship something. And when we are not disciplined about worshiping God, it becomes easier for us to fall into the same pattern as the Israelites. And we begin to worship false gods. We begin to devote ourselves to things that are not God. And they can be very good things, things that God delights in, but when those things that might be very good, maybe it is our job, maybe it is our relationships, even those good things, when they take God's place and role in our lives, become false idols. And so today I want to invite you to name those false idols. To turn around and to be disciplined and your devotion to the one true God, the God who's revealed himself to us through Scripture, the God who is still in the life-changing business. And that's where I want to spend the rest of our time focusing today, is the divine potential for change, for transformation. And it happens later in the story when Moses has to talk God off a ledge, God decides that after these Israelites have committed the first and worst sin in the wilderness, they worship this false idol, they throw their jewelry into a fire and out comes this golden calf and they start to worship and dance in front of this calf and it's like the worst violation that these people can commit against God. They've basically cheated on God. And they start to worship this object that they made. And so God is thoroughly upset with these people and he's ready to start over. And the truth is God would have been justified in starting over. God would still be fulfilling the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if God started over and started with Moses and his family. He could still fulfill the promise and upheld his holiness. But instead, we find here in this passage that Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. Moses pleaded with God for these people. Now think about the significance for a moment. I want you to hone in your entire attention onto this one passage. And it's right here. It says that Moses pleaded with the Lord. Think about the significance of Moses praying to God on behalf of these rebellious people. they have been like a thorn in his side and here he is praying for them. Something changed in Moses. And that's what I want to offer you today is that if God's grace can change Moses like this, then God's grace can change you today. These people were ready to kill Moses on multiple occasions. It began when they started to cry out for food because they were starving. They'd been walking around for days and it'd been days since they walked through the Red Sea with Egypt in their rear view mirror and they were hungry. And they were looking to Moses, their fearful leader. Moses was not a fearless leader. 
Moses was full of fear and uncertainty and doubt. And still God used him to lead those people through the sea. And the people turned to their fearful leader. And they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die here in the desert from hunger? And Moses turns to God and Moses said, these people are about to stone me. Why did you bring me out here with them to die? And so God tells Moses that God's going to feed them in the wilderness. And if you remember that lesson from a few weeks ago, that alone is a sign of God's grace. In the midst of their complaining, God provides for his people. And I wonder if that was one step along the way to Moses' transformation that we read here later in chapter 32. And again, they go on a little bit farther away from Egypt in slavery and captivity. And now they're thirsty. And they've already been feasting on bread from heaven, but now they're thirsty. And they come to Moses with the same complaint. Why did you bring us out of Egypt so we could die here in the desert from thirst? And Moses once again turns to God and says, these people are about to kill me. And God says to Moses, take the staff in your hand the same staff that you used as a sign of my wonders in Egypt and take that staff and strike the rock and a spring of water is going to gush forth. And so Moses took his little stick and tapped on the rock and the rock burst forth with water and quenched the people's thirst. And I wonder if that was another step along the road to Moses' transformation because by the time Moses had been on the mountaintop and the mountain was filled with a thick cloud of smoke, it was blazing on fire and Moses entered into the cloud of God's presence and something changed in Moses' life. Because by the time God is ready to smite the Israelites, then Moses steps in on their behalf and says, God, you've got to spare them because I love them. Something changed about Moses. And it was nothing that Moses could do on his own. It was only after experiencing God's grace in Egypt after experiencing God's grace when the people begged for bread, after experiencing God's grace when the water poured from the rock, and after Moses stepped into the thick cloud of God's presence, after Moses walked into the mystery and the wonder of God that Moses experienced this transformation that only God's grace can provide. Something changed in Moses and was God's grace that changed him to the point that the very people who were ready to kill Moses are the very ones that Moses came to love as their spiritual shepherd. If you've been walking for far too long with resentment and fear, with anxiety and doubt, there is a grace that can change you, that can save you, and that can show you what it is to love like God. This grace is free to us and we have a chance to experience it every single day when we remember to walk into the cloud of God's presence. When we remember to worship the one true God. When we open our hearts and our minds to love God's people the way God does. Thanks be to God. Amen. If your heart craves this kind of transformation, if you recognize that something in your life isn't quite right, 
that there's a disconnect between you and God, or maybe there's a fracture in your relationship with others, then I want to encourage you to come with me right now to the throne of God's grace in prayer as we ask God to change us from the inside, to love people like Jesus does. You know, Jesus experienced his fair share of resentment and still offered his life for all of us on the cross when we didn't deserve it. We get a foretaste of Jesus' love when we experience that intercessory prayer that Moses offered to God. That was a, a little example of the kind of love that we would experience in Jesus Christ. And so if you want to experience that grace for yourself, I want to invite you to join me now in a posture of prayer. So I want to encourage you, if, if you need to kneel in God's presence, or if you want to lift your hands, or close your eyes, or put your hands together, whatever posture is meaningful for you in your time with God right now, I want you to find that prayerful posture and join me now in prayer. Almighty God, thank you for your love, your patience, your endurance. We are humbled when we think about all that you have endured for us, especially when you sent your Son to live for us, to show us a new way of living, to die for us, to forgive us of our sins, and to rise for us, to assure us of the promise of the kind of transformation that you can produce in our lives. We pray for that resurrection power right now, that as we put to death the false idols, as we turn away from our wrongdoings, and as we turn to you, as we enter into the thick cloud of your presence in our lives, we're opening ourselves up to your life-changing grace. And we welcome your grace for us, your love for us, your unconditional, undeserving, never stopping kind of love. And we ask you to change us, God. God, we ask that we could experience the recovery of your image in us. God, we want to love like Jesus. We want to be loved by Jesus. We want to love Jesus in all that we do. And so we pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's word, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to a very special time in our worship that we call our offering. This is a chance where we get to show God our praise. What I want you to do is to think about joining us in our challenge to follow the biblical standard of offering 10% of our financial gifts to be put to God's use in the world. This ancient tradition that we call tithing goes all the way back to Genesis before Moses in the time of Abraham. And it's a way of keeping ourselves in check and remembering where all that we have comes from. And it's learning to live on the other 90% of what God has given us. So I want to thank you if you've accepted this challenge or if you're working towards a goal of giving a tenth of what you have to the church to be put to use to make a difference in this world. 
So let's go worship God together by going online or mailing in your contributions with our tithes and our offerings. good news about our message today is that people can change. By God's grace, we can be filled with a holy love. And so I pray that you open your heart to God's grace today, that you receive that life-changing grace so that you can go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that you do. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.